uh, I'm the director for communication and advancement at the university, and I am going to be your program director here, and program director with the least to do. Um, I'm going to introduce to you um, some of the guests that we've got. Um, Frankly, and in all fairness, I should be introducing all celebrity participants here because everyone is that important. Uh, but we may not have time to do that. So I probably will, in some instances, refer to categories of people who are represented in this important uh, strategic planning session of Rhodes University. In our midst, we have got our Vice Chancellor, Professor Cesar Mabizera. Uh, I'm sure everybody, or almost everybody here, would know who. Professor Cesar Mabizera is. We have our Deputy Vice Chancellor, both of them. We have got uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Professor Peter Clayton, and we have got our um, Vice Chancellor Mayor Mabokan Mapesela. We have got our deans for all six faculties represented here. We've got our head of departments. Um, represented here, we've got directors of divisions from Rhodes University represented here. We have got um, union representatives uh, from the two trade unions that are recognized at our university, Dale and Nehao, represented here. And we've got the student leadership, the president of the SRC and some senior SRC leaders represented here. In our midst also we've got very important and special guests. Uh, I'll start with uh, Dr. Tamit Sani. Uh, she is the council, the new council representative. Uh, for those of you who have not met Dr. Tisani, she's sitting at the second row with a hand up and a very nice maroon beret. And um, Dr. Tisani is Umam Zorcho, but uh, she gave me a nice Dressing down for calling her mom's auto. She doesn't deny that she's mom's auto, but she says that Uli's auto, Elise, beautiful mom's auto. So, welcome, Dr. Uh, Tisan. It's good to have you here. And we also have got our uh, preeminent facilitators for these sessions. Um, uh, Professor Neil Pierce teaches at uh, the School of Business. He's sitting right here, many of you would have, would have met him. And he's going to be co-facilitating with uh, Mr. Trevor Amos from the uh, management department. Is that right? Well, Mr. Amos, he, he tells, I want some more details from him, but uh, what he shared with me is not to be shared. Uh, unless uh, I find myself being sued. Um, so those are the special guests that we have got. And um, uh, all of you would have received the program. Um, I, I hope, and you will see that there are important strategic preliminaries that we need to deal with before we come to some of the critical logistical um, uh, communication or arrangements that we need to communicate and share with each other. So in terms of this, I will invite the Vice Chancellor to welcome us to this session and share with us what is the broad purpose and what expectations we should, we should bring with us and what are the responsibilities also that go with that. And after that, I'll come back here and introduce our keynote speaker, who is a special guest on her own. For now, over to you, uh, Professor Cesar Mami. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, colleagues, welcome to the Rhodes University Le Club 2022. Let me also extend a very warm welcome to our guest speaker, Dr. Tammy Lewin, who has very kindly agreed to share some thoughts with us. Um, I also have a warmest welcome to uh, our member of council, Dr. Tisan, as Luz uh, has indicated. Colleagues, the two and a half days that we will spend here at Mpegwene are absolutely important 
for the future of our university. I've been looking forward to these two and a half days with great excitement and also with great anticipation. This retreat on the Kutla has been arranged as an opportunity for the leadership of our university to reflect on where we have been, where we are, and where we would like to be in the future as an institution of higher learning. Our deliberations in the two and a half days we are here should provide a clear direction regarding the future of our university, its place in the higher education sector, its place in Makanda, in the Eastern Cape province in South Africa, in the continent of Africa, and more globally. As suggested in our framing document, Mkombandela, reimagining our future, the new IDP should articulate a bold and an ambitious vision of how we will continue to advance strategically from our current position of strength and achievement to one of a leading national research intensive university, able to enhance its contribution for the betterment of humanity and the advancement of sustainable development. It should incorporate important lessons that we have learned over the past five years, including those that flow from our experience with the COVID-19 pandemic. Chief among these is the use of digital technology to support the intellectual endeavor of our university. The new IDP should ensure that Rhodes University remains a strong, intellectually vibrant, resilient, and sustainable institution and a place of opportunity for all. In 2024, our university will celebrate its 120th year of existence. This university occupies a special and distinctive place in our higher education landscape. We have a duty and the responsibility to look after it and ensure that we equip future generations a strong, resilient, well-functioning, respectable, distinct and distinctive institution of higher learning that is able to make its rightful contribution for the betterment of our society and humankind. We have suggested that we should take on board the UN SDGs, the AU Agenda 2063, the Africa We Want documents, as we reflect on our ideas. We have also indicated that we should take on board our national development plan. The simple reality is that the 17 SDG goals can never be achieved without education. The centrality of education in achieving all the SDG goals can never be overemphasized. And of course, the certain aspirations of the African Union Agenda 2063, Africa we want. You can never achieve those without education. And so it is important that we reflect on these and incorporate all the ideas in what we do. We must bequeath future generations an institution that is a place of hope and a place of opportunity for all. In this regard, sorry, in this Kekutla, we must discuss strategies and concrete actions that we must take to position our university at the forefront of knowledge generation, knowledge dissemination, and knowledge application. An institution that is ready and able to play its role in addressing the pressing and urgent local and global challenges. 
We must discuss strategies and concrete actions we must take to position Rhodes University as an institution of higher learning where the best and brightest young people of our country and beyond would want to pursue their education, their higher education studies. Among the many lessons of the COVID-19 pandemic that we have learned is just how uncertain life can be. We should therefore focus less on preparing our graduates for a job, but educate them and prepare them for a future, an uncertain future, an unknown future, an unknowable future, an unpredictable future, a complex future. We should produce graduates who are critical thinkers and problem solvers, graduates who are innovative and are unafraid of taking risks. We have a track record and an, and an enviable reputation of research excellence. In this Zekutla, we must discuss strategies and concrete actions that must be taken to ensure that our university remains at the forefront of research and innovation. Such an innovation that advances knowledge for public good. We must discuss strategies and concrete actions to develop a nurturing environment where everyone can reach their full potential. We must discuss strategies and concrete actions for the financial sustainability of our university. We have articulated a number of issues that we need to deliberate on. This is the place where we will shape the future of Rhodes University. Not for the five, next five years, not for the next 10 years, but for the next 120 years. Once more, a very warm welcome to you all. I look forward to your robust discussions that can build on our current successes as we position our university for the future. A very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chancellor, for those uh, uh, important opening remarks um, that certainly orientate our thinking uh, in terms of the requirements of a session, a session of this nature. It says we must think into a distant future. So, what is it that we can do today that will have an uh, important impact and implication for our university and its purposes in, in, in a distant future? So, that requires some great conceptual reorientation. Thank you very much. I will now introduce to you our very special guest, uh, Dr. Tandy Lewin, who is going to deliver a keynote address um, at, at, at this session this morning. Um, Dr. Tandy Lewin um, works in the Department of Higher Education and Training, um, which we refer to as DHET, D-H-E-T. She is the Chief Director for Institutional Governance and, and Management Support in the University Education Branch of the Department. Um, her responsibilities there include student policy, funding policy, uh, oversight of the NSFAS, uh, University Governance Oversight, and Student Development and Support Matters, among other areas that she is responsible for. From February 2021, uh, Dr. Lewin, to March 2022, Dr. Lewin was acting as Deputy Director General for University Education uh, within the department. Previously, she coordinated the development of a national plan for post-school education and training. Prior to that, Dr. Lewin worked as uh, for JET Education Services, where she was responsible for monitoring and evaluation, and the Department of Education as a Chief Director for Equity in Education and later University Policy. She, was also, she has also worked uh, in the non-profit uh, sector, uh, university, as well as the philanthropic sectors. Her work has been broadly in the field of higher education policy and 
education, as well as social justice. Dr. Lewin holds a Bachelor of Social Sciences degree, this obtained from the University of Cape Town, a Master's degree in Education and International Development from the University College um, of London, as well as a PhD from the University of the Free State. Dr. Lewin was a member of the Rhodes Council between 2014 and 2017. I would like to invite Dr. Lowen to the front to deliver the main address. Let's give her a warm round of Thank you for the embarrassing introduction. <laughs> um, I think that never happened to me. Um, uh, it's really nice to be here at Rhodes. Um, thanks for inviting me, Prof. Mabizela. I've actually known Prof. Mabizela since I was a student at UCT, <laughs> where we, uh, we sat in meetings and I was a, a member of the SRC. This is uh, almost 30 years ago. <laughs> so we've known each other a long time and uh, more recently, I spent time on the Rhodes Council. Unfortunately, I had to leave a bit early, earlier than my term ended because I took this job in the department. It would have been a direct conflict of interest because one of the things I do is advise on ministerial appointees for the minister. Um, and I was a ministerial appointee, so yeah. And then, um, I don't know, I have a long, a, a, sort of stranger, older connection with Rhodes University in that both my parents studied here. <laughs> in the, uh, my father is no longer around, but my mother is 83, about to be 83, I think. So she was here, they were here in the late 1950s, so it was, I think, quite different. Um, yeah, so I'm, I know about it from those days as well. Um, so thanks very much for inviting me. I really hope that what I will talk about will be useful. Um, it's really an honor to be here. And I can see that you've got a very busy two and a half day. So I'll try and keep my input to 30 minutes. And then I anticipate normally when I'm coming as a department representative that there's lots of questions. So if there's time for questions, I'm happy to try and answer some of them um, as well. I'm used to being uh, ask a lot of questions. Um, I didn't do a PowerPoint as well. I took the liberty of being able to do a keynote. So I thought it might be useful, and I, I hope it's useful for you if I focus on a broader set of contextual reflections on higher education um, in South Africa, and obviously drawing on South Africa in the context of global change. So I think that many of the many of the issues I'll talk about you may know about, but. I guess I'm just providing a different perspective from, from where I'm sitting. And I hope that it will be helpful to set in the background. Um, if there's more data required that I'm giving you or the statistics are not adequate, I'm happy to get um, data ready. Um, we can get more of the data from my colleagues and send it, and send it over to you. So the, the first thing I wanted to say is that um, universities are really critical social institutions. Um, this is recognized in our national policy framework. Um, you, of course, know that the expectations of universities are very high. You only need to look at the NDP for this. And I, I quite like going back to this quote from the NDP because it gives you a sense of quite how much we expect from universities. It says, universities are key to developing a nation. They play three main functions in society. Firstly, they educate and train people with high level skills for the employment needs of the public and private sector. Secondly, universities are the dominant producers of new knowledge, and they critique information and find new local and global applications for existing knowledge. Universities also set norms and standards, determine the curriculum, languages, and knowledge, ethics, and philosophy underpinning a nation's knowledge capital. South Africa needs knowledge that equips people for a society in constant change. Thirdly, Given this country's apartheid history, higher education provides opportunities for social mobility and simultaneously strengthens equity, social justice, and democracy. In today's knowledge society, higher education underpinned by a strong 
science and technology innovation system is increasingly important in opening up people's opportunities. That is 2012, so 10 years ago now. The NDP positions universities as central to economic and social development um, and transformation. It also recognizes to a certain extent that while higher education has instrumental value, for example, in educating young people for employability, for entrepreneurship, for developing useful skills, it also has a deeper human value in expanding human capabilities. Um, the freedom for people to live the life that they value and flourish or to achieve well-being. Um, as Melody Walker says, uh, she was my PhD supervisor, the development of knowledge for cultivating critical and creative intellectual capacities for meaningful lives. Um, this is also reflected in our White Paper 3, the White Paper that came out in 1997 quite strongly, and I also um, think that it's very well outlined in Rhodes University's vision and, and mission statements and institutional plans. So I think it's central, clearly central to the goals of the university. But the point that I want to make, and maybe a theme that runs through what I want to talk about is, if you look at our national policy documents, universities are recognized as important. But the question I would ask you now, is the position of universities in society guaranteed? Um, and I would have to say, unfortunately not. Um, change is inevitable. And I wanted to try and make some suggestions as I go along about what this may mean for our public universities. There are, as you know, huge disruptions, um, both globally and locally, which I think you know quite well, particularly after the last two years of, of COVID, or two and a half years of COVID. Um, I'll try and talk to some of these. And at the same time, there are also continuities. Um, your former Vice Chancellor, um, Salim Badat, has just produced a, a short piece on teaching and learning and looks at continuities and disruptions um, you know, at a sort of theoretical level, it's quite a useful and quite short piece if you, if you want to have a look at it. Um, he published it through the Sarki Chair on Teaching and Learning at UJ, um, which is where he's uh, connected. Um, so some of these continuities bring stability, but at the same time, some of these continuities make it very difficult for us to transform the system. So I, um, I'm going to... I'm going to end up missing some key things out, so, so forgive me for that, uh, even some of the key things that I deal with myself, but I try to uh, situate my contextual input in four big areas, and I think these are all interrelated areas, they are overlapping in many ways, but I hope they assist in a way as some lenses um, that I'm bringing from my experience at national level. Um, and these questions, I think, hopefully will help to frame the key issues, and I'll touch on some, one or at least one of the more controversial issues at the end um, that you've outlined in your plans. So the four areas are sustainability, um, the finance people are here, they're obviously going to know what I'm talking about, but I will give some more detail about what I mean. Trust, um, I'll explain that, inequality, and then skills, and skills is a very narrow way of talking about what I want to talk about. So those are the four sort of areas I want to talk about. So sustainability, I think wherever you're sitting, um, you probably know a lot of this. The department and the higher education budget, ironically, is the fastest growing budget in government at the current time. We have received additional allocations, even in this budget, uh, 28, 2022, 23 medium term expenditure framework. The challenge is that those budget allocations are mainly to address the shortfall in this budget. So those funding, those additional allocations um, are to support access and success for poor and working class students in the system. Now, given the pernicious inequalities of the past, this is an absolutely critical policy for government. And it has had a very positive effect. Even if you look, if you look at our cohort studies that the department publishes annually, you can see that on average the performance of NISPA students is very good. And it does go against some of the public discourses that are out there. But the fact of the matter is that our HEMIS data, which we get from you, show that NISPA students, on average, perform significantly better, on average, than the, 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 the co broader cohort of undergraduate students. And that's even in a NISPA regime where students were not funded under the current policy regime, which is, which is a, a, a fully subsidized regime. However, at the same time, uh, all state budgets have been cut. 
and it's very important that I that I tell you that you will have seen that on the side of the, of, of, of the Department of Science and Innovation and the NRF and of course um, the DSI funding, but you will also have seen it in the in, in our own subsidy funding. So this is partly a result of the COVID pandemic. And what you will also know is that the growth over the medium term expenditure framework is very, very minimal. And in fact, the, the, the increase in the subsidy next year is, is really probably the smallest that we've had for quite a long time. And in 2018 and 2019, however, we received significantly increased budget in the higher education sector. Um, and and I, you, your council members and your senior executives will be able to explain how that, what that allowed roads to do, but it definitely did allow you know, space for roads to do things that it had been wanting to do. And I think universities will be very much reflecting on what they, you know, what they were able to do at that time, given now the situation that we're in. So what, 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 what's happening now is that even though we've had growth in allocation, and even though we're the fastest growing budget in government, we still not uh, we're still having a case where the subsidy budget for higher education is being eroded. Um, and this also means that the circumstances that led to fees must fall haven't gone away. Um, so we still have a very high reliance on tuition fee income, and um, we have always got a concern that above inflation tuition fee increases might become a reality, and we have a government subsidy that struggles to keep up with growth in the system. We also have had substantial investment from government in infrastructure funding, billions over quite some time. And again, your finance executives will be able to show you how much you know, that contribution has made a difference to, to Rhodes' own development of its infrastructure. But um, we've had five cycles of the infrastructure and efficiency grant, and the, the billions have, have grown significantly. But unfortunately now, that funding is also on, on the decline. Um, and this is at a time where we're trying to expand the system and where, of course, you know, maintenance issues um, and, and, and innovations, I guess, also in infrastructure are becoming more and more important. Um, the other issue that is, is really becoming key is that um, the underspending, and this isn't necessarily specific to this particular institution, but in the system, there's general underspending and there's quite slow spending of infrastructure. And what this has meant is that National Treasury puts us under increasing scrutiny and where money is not spent, where state funds that are being essentially borrowed from, where government is actually borrowing to pass those funds on to institutions, there's the tolerance for that is, is, is already almost at zero level. So this is going to affect how universities manage the funding that they get from the state. Um, I've talked about re reduction in research budgets. There's a growing reliance on the state subsidy, approximately 44%, if you look at our system as a whole, on state subsidy, first stream income, second stream income, approximately 33%, and, and, and relatively small 23% on third stream income. And of course, um, for some universities, third stream income is a very difficult issue, and Rhodes has its own particular challenges. But income under, from fees is also under threat, um, but all uh, sources of income are under strain. Um, the other problem is that the student funding budget, which has grown exponentially um, from six billion in 2014-15 to 46 billion uh, in 2020, um, it's a lot of money. If you compare the total LISBUS budget to the 47.6 billion uh, university subsidy budget in this year's budget, um, then you can see that where our concern is there were some serious sustainability concerns raised by that um, for the system and for government. And the proportion of students funded exceeds 60% of undergraduate students. So it's obviously not going to be that high as Rose, but it, it, in, fact, it, in fact, I think it might be actually about 60% of Rose. Um, but over the system, it's that some institutions probably have less, but at some institutions have over 90% of their students whose tuition fees and subsidy costs are covered by the state. So it's a big, big issue. Um, and and <coughs> it's not to say that the policy, that, as I said, the policy is extremely important and a very powerful one, but at the same time, you know, at the time where budgets are being cut across government, we, we've really faced uh, cuts and sustainability of the funding scheme is a matter of concern. The minister appointed an MTT in June last year. That MTT is well represented by universities. Um, it's chaired by the Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Chaucer, and there were a number of university representatives on that MTT, and it has 
made its recommendations to the minister, which are now going to cabinet. Um, and what the NCT has also tried to do is to not look in isolation at the NISPAS budget, which has been one of the problems we've had in the past, but to look at broader student funding requirements. What can be done to support missing middle students, postgraduate funding issues, etc. But there's still policy instability in this area and anticipate for quite a while. Fee regulation um, is going to be a reality uh, in the future, which is not about equalizing fees across the sector, although there is a need to address some of the inequalities in fees across the sector, but it's also about more transparency. What is it that a tuition fee is composed of? What makes up a tuition fee? Um, this is gonna be a focus area over time. And then also about making sure that tuition and accommodation fees are affordable both for students and their families, and of course for government. But the thing is, we've had seven years of annual fee agreements in the system now, seven years, since 2015, since the 0% fee increase, which of course was covered predominantly from the state and from the National Skills Fund, as was a significant portion of the NISPA shortfall last year. So, um, this is something that we're going to have to work out going forward. We are aiming to get into a situation where we have three-year agreements on fee, fee increases um, and also putting in place a fair and hopefully fairly independent system for determining fee increases going forward. And hopefully the proposals on this will be available quite soon. Uh, student debt, as you know, is growing rapidly. Um, the sustainability of the entire student funding ecosystem is based on student debt. Um, I've got a whole lot of statistics here, but I'll just tell you that in 2020, which is our latest analysis of the annual financial statement, we're busy with 2021 now, student debt in the system was at 16.5 billion rand. Um, and it had grown from 6.45 billion in 2015. So that's a huge increase in a five year period. Um, and the increase, uh, what, what is also happening is that you know, provision of, for debt is growing and of course a lot of that debt is being written off by institutions. So it's a significant issue for institutions. I know it's a significant issue for this institution. One of course the factors is COVID-19 is gonna probably make it even worse in 2021, but, but also um, there are other factors contributing to this and I think we need to understand that better. So let me get off sustainability before I depress you completely. But I want to say, what the challenge for universities is remaining viable, paying attention to funding and budgets. I uh, can assure you uh, your leadership team does that. But there's a lot of discussion also now about entrepreneurial universities and how universities you know, can essentially make money off you know, their, what, what they have to offer. Um, and I know, of course, Rhodes is, is doing the same. Um, you know, you can see uh, UCT has got an online high school now. You know, many universities have, have income generating enterprise units. From a government perspective, this is something that obviously we support because we know universities need to in, in diversify their income. At the same time, I think the big focus from our side is going to be on the governance of that. And the you know, issues around ethics and governance of, of these things are going to be quite important going forward. But entrepreneurial universities, it's the way uh, things need to go. I also wanted to say that it, the need to justify expenditure and budgets is going to become much, much more intense. We don't have a cost-based system. Um, so there's an issue about whether we really can argue or understand what the cost of delivering higher education is. Um, we have quite a high cost system. If you look at the OECD reports, we're sort of 2.5 times higher than the OECD average. So it's hard to justify, and of course staffing costs make up quite a significant uh, cost, uh, the biggest cost driver in the system. So, so the, all I'm signaling is that we're going to have to justify this a lot more. We're seeing this already. Um, we as a department, when we engage with the fund list with National Treasury, this is a big, big issue. National sustainability is a big concern. The fiscal constraints are real, and you are going to feel that over the next few years. You have, you've already felt it, but it's not going to get better in the immediate term. Infrastructure funding, I've already said. Policy instability is a huge challenge. I wish I could, I could say to you that we're gonna have uh, stability in student funding in the regulation of tuition fees, but we are in, we're in a, a, a year of the NC conference. There are national elections coming up in two years time. So I'm just, you know, uh, political dynamics do play a role in some of these decisions. The other thing I wanted to say is that collaboration, 
collaboration is going to become more and more important across the system and next year. What kinds of shared services will be possible at national level? What kind of shared platforms? Teaching and learning platforms, open educational resources, digital libraries. There's, there's so much that needs to be explored and this is going to become a matter of, you know, really a matter of, of sustainability and survivability for the system. So it's something for Rose to think about. The second issue, then move on from sustainability. But, uh, so the second issue is about trust, um, or maybe also like respect. And I think that this point is made, uh, it's not my point, but I think it's really something that I see a lot in my work, that the public and political trust in universities is quite it's weak and it's weakening. Um, I don't know if it's how easy it is for you to see that. Uh, maybe you see it in different ways in your work. This has been pointed out by many people. Prof Ahmed Bawa talks about this quite a lot. From outside universities, they still appear elite. They, sit, they appear sometimes irrelevant, they appear untransformed. But this is, it also has to be understood in a broader global context. We live in a post-truth world. There's a dominance of social media. The ability for people to manipulate through media is strong. So on the one hand, we have a growing recognition of the importance of science and an understanding of the complexity of um, social and economic political problems. But at the same time, there's also a desire for simplicity and simple explanations. And some of these trends are actually quite serious for universities. Um, the COVID-19 kind of gives you a sense of that. I mean, you, really some of the most important knowledge that led to uh, the global handling of the COVID pandemic came from universities and from many of our own universities as well. But at the same time, um, there's a great suspicion of that scientific knowledge if you look at the, um, the reluctance for people to vaccinate, etc. So, so, I mean, we're at an interesting time in the world. I mean, um, it's, and it's very difficult for engaged science because at the same time, we also need greater focus on evidence-based policy making. So there's a real a sort of suspicion in a way of universities, but at the same time, there's a real need for the knowledge that is being generated by universities to translate into policy relevant outputs. And universities need to think very, very seriously about the role that they can play in bringing innovation and the work that you do into the public domain and making it relevant to, to public policy. The other issue about trust is around governance and leadership. And this is much broader again because you see a broader suspicion of public institutions and of course a you know, uh, the failure of some of our public institutions really does also impact, in a sense, on universities, um, which is not to say that universities aren't well governed, although some of them really aren't. Um, um, but it is a real perception in society where there's a deep suspicion of public institutions. And the idea that universities are self serving and elite, and in some cases corrupt, which in some cases they are, is a very real perception out there. Um, the other thing is that there's a big growth in the private sector. We have approximately 200,000 students in the private sector, so it's pushing the 20% of our system margin. Um, that's not something for us to be obsessed about, but it is something to note. Um, and it also might be a sign of declining trust in public institutions. It's also a sign that we don't have the space in public institutions that we should have. So trust is also about relationships. Um, nowadays, they talk about the, they had the triple helix, and then there was the quadruple helix, and now there's the quid quintuple helix, which I only discovered about the other day. But the quintuple helix is universities, industry, and government, plus communities, as, uh, you know, the non-profit sector, plus the, envir the environment, our natural environment, and sustainability. So what Prof. Mabizela said about the Sustainable Development Goals, absolutely critical. Universities have to be seen to be meaningfully addressing the global challenges facing our world. These are climate change and environmental sustainability, energy crises, the crises around racism and discrimination, and the reversal of pro progressive gains in gender equality, for example. The prevalence of violence and a, a disrespect for human life, which is a particularly South African challenge, and global health challenges and many, many others. Um, very important that universities are able to, not in many ways they are dealing with those issues, but to be able to articulate how they are also doing it. And then also local trust, which is a massive issue for universities like Rose, given the weak state institutions at local level. I'm not going to say anything about national level. But it's what um, uh, Prof. Lechana at um, UJ calls 
the neglect of the proper functioning of the state. And um, he says that the inefficiencies of public institutions reflect our own collective weakness. Um, so this is something that Rose always confronted and it's something that affects the day to day operations, but it's a big issue for trust. So what am I saying for universities? Universities have to do everything they can to ensure that the knowledge they produce is engaged and engaged with. This is complex, but it requires active, purposeful, and focused work. And it's also something that can be done collaboratively. Continue to talk about and get better at showing the ways in which the university is producing engaged research, addressing the grand challenges facing the country and the world. Essentially, this is about relevance. Universities will also be called upon increasingly to justify their knowledge production, show its effects, translate into policy implications, and social and environmental economic value. Universities and their communities must be nurtured, and by communities I mean local, national, and international. And then paying attention to governance, leadership, and management is really important so that we can show strong public institutions. Um, and I'm not sure how long I've been talking about now start exactly on time, so I'm just going to try and get through the next two very quickly. The next one is inequality, and I mean, it's basically that, I, I don't need to talk in too much depth, because I know you know a lot about this, but this is, and inequality is unfortunately the basis of our education system. Who accesses university, under what circumstances, which school you'll go to still determines a lot about your future, access to higher education, we still have low participation rates, especially for African and colored students. Many people do not make it to university. Um, many people still do not finish schooling. Of, of the 100 students who go to, to grade one, only about 12 will actually make it to university. Only about six will end up with a university qualification. And uh, we need to sort that data out because it actually only comes from one year of data. But nonetheless, it gives you a sense. The shape of the system is, is changing slowly. We have slow growth in TVET colleges only about 500,000 enrollments and approximately 1.1 million university students and very low enrollments in community colleges. But our policy focus is very much on a post-school system, on what can be done outside of the university system to offer opportunities for young people. And this includes a significant focus on the development of TVET colleges, on curriculum change in TVET colleges, on their responsiveness, um, the relationship with industry and workplaces for TVET graduates, etc. So this is a very strong focus of our white paper and the work of the department. And it's very important that universities are also able to outline the ways in which they are contributing to the development of the broader system. In what ways are universities advancing the need for greater articulation between school and TVET college graduates and how are universities contributing? What are you doing and can you clearly articulate this? Um, the fact is that the demand for higher education is growing and will continue to grow, but we can't accommodate all the students. Um, I, I'm not going to talk too much about this because this is, in a sense, this is an area where Rose has huge expertise, and I wanted to tell you that until you know it, but maybe just tell you that from a national perspective, Rose um, and the study of teaching and learning and the study of what student success is about. Rose is one of the leading universities, and there's some really key research that's come out of this, and there's key. Uh, you have very key strengths in this area. Um, and student success and throughput rates are a massive issue at a national level. I know that Rhodes has relatively good student success rates. But the kinds of things, so, you know, Prof. Bowie and Keda recently produced a book called Understanding Higher Education Alternative Perspectives. And I, I mean, your vice chancellor in the introduction does urge everyone to read it, but I would also urge everyone to read it. It's a really brilliant book. It's the culmination of years and years of theoretical study on this area, and it's really critical uh, for us to understand socially, uh, to get a under social understanding and contextualized understanding of students as social beings and um, the importance of not seeing students and staff as decontextualized. Um, and and uh, there, there's, there's a lot of work in this area. I, I don't wanna, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna move on a little bit. But um, the question is, can this work that is being done here and in other places, can it be done sustainably? And if so, how? And then um, um, I just want to point out again, if you want to read more about this, I just want to talk a little bit about inequality and just to signal a few things. Inequality in, in digital inequality um, because of the importance of technology. And I see it's obviously going to be a big focus of your discussion is how Rose you know, enhances its use of technology to support its key goals. 
Um, we did a survey with Free State um, in 2020 on South African and students' use of learning materials, which is really very key for pointing out some of the key areas of digital inequality. Um, I've got some of the findings here, but uh, I won't go into them because I don't have time. The CHE and USAP also did a study on staff experiences under COVID, which is very, very important for, for us looking at some of the inequalities. The fact is COVID has, has showed up our inequalities that were always there. The fault lines in our system can not be ignored uh, anymore. And the forced move to remote teaching and learning has really um, brought some of these things out. And there's a lot of positive about that because there's a lot of opportunities there. And in some ways, it was very positive how the system responded. But we've also learned a lot about um, some of the masks, that, some of what is being masked, you know, about kind of enduring inequalities about student success. Um, about academic integrity, assessment, etc. So there's a lot, a lot of work being done there. And and but, so I can just finish off on digital inequality, but I wanted to talk about it more. Laura Chernivitz, who's at DCT, has written quite a lot about this recently, and I would really urge you to read her, um, particularly an article that she wrote called "Multi-Layered Digital Inequalities: The Paradox of the Post-Digital Society." I can send you the link. Um, she says, the digital divide is alive and well. Indeed, the digital paradox is that even as the basics of the divide are addressed through access, more complex layers of exclusion are added. Digital inequalities thus morph into new complicated forms. Nevertheless, fair and equitable technological infrastructure is the foundation of inclusion in HD, um, electricity devices, ubiquitous connectivity, and cheap data. These are essential but insufficient. Um, she talks a lot about technology as a public good and I think she really, uh, she's, the things she studies are things that we don't always see visibly happening in our system, but that, um, you know, there's a lot of really good opportunities in technology, but there's a lot of things that have to be really carefully thought through. So she's saying, look at this stuff, but look at it while paying attention to the danger of, dangers of inequality. And really, she's arguing for much more, much deeper research on educational technology. So I'm going to just quickly go to my last point, which is going to be shorter. So this is about skills, but the central point I wanted to make is, uh, uh, and I mean, I should have said this earlier, we have really high levels of unemployment in South Africa. We have over 60% youth unemployment. It's currently about 60, it's under 64%. Um, that's really, really high um, anyway. And we have growing general levels of unemployment. However, graduate unemployment for those with degrees is about 12%. It used to be six, so obviously the increase is related to the state of the economy and the scarcity of jobs. But uh, youth unemployment is serious. Um, but what this means is that there's a high demand for higher education and that demand will grow um, and the pressure will not abate on institutions. But the, the, the other point I want to make here is that universities are blamed for not being responsive to the labor market. Um, I personally think this is, it's wrong, but there is a view that universities need to keep up with skills needs, and there's a growing discourse on um, higher education as skilled labor. Um, Bowie and McKenna, the book I spoke to earlier, they say the focus on work readiness is thus, we would argue, largely misplaced. Um, they, they quote Alais and Ashwin, that the construct of the knowledge economy has resulted in a narrowing of the purpose of higher education to the provision of skilled labor. Um, I think this is really something to be taken quite seriously, certainly at the national level. So at the time, you know, we, we have relatively weak skills planning, but at the same time, there's a lot of work going on master skills plans. We're developing a master skills plan. We've got skills plan to, to respond to the, to the economic reconstruction and um, recovery plan. Um, but there's a greater focus on, on the responsiveness of university curricula um, in many ways. And there's also now more and more in the higher education space a recognition of the importance of breadth of curricula. If you look at the importance of uh, social sciences in, in science education as well, greater interdisciplinarity, entrepreneurship, etc. But the irony is that um, this is also happening when there's also a sort of narrow, narrower political understanding of the role of universities. And so, why, why I'm saying that is that what it means for universities is that universities are going to have to pay attention to this and they're going to have to be arguing for why it is that you need to have a broad, a broad education, why it is that you will be teaching in particular ways, 
what you are doing about agility, what you are doing about entrepreneurship, um, what you are doing about curriculum development, um, what you are doing about graduate attributes, tracer studies, where are your students ending up, is very going to be very important at institutional and national level. Um, and also issues of work integrated learning and um, while unemployment remains high, students will want to stay in higher education. So, what, you know, this increases the value of qualifications as well. So there's a whole set of, of issues around there, but I, I think what I wanted to say to you was that this was around this is quite strong at the moment. Um, and I, I, I fear it's going to be quite difficult for universities, that this is going to have to be something that you, you, you can argue for quite strongly. Um, so this is my the final point on rankings, because I saw it in your document, and I know it's very controversial, and as a, probably as a public servant, I'm not supposed to say anything about it. But I know it's a big debate for Rose. I thought <clears throat> it's a conundrum for many institutions, but I thought um, it's something you're going to be debating, so I'd say something. On the one hand, um, rankings are a reality. They play an important role despite their significant weaknesses. And again, if you want to read about this, the fascinating book on this is Chris Brink's book about the soul of university, a complete and utter takedown of the ranking system. Really, really interesting um, for many reasons. Um, so they're deeply flawed, but the, the, um, they, they are. it is important to, for you to look at the pros and cons. And I thought maybe if you look at it in terms of the questions that I've asked, the sustainability question, does it help sustainability? Maybe, but it may also have significant costs associated. Does it help with inequality? No. Does it help with quality? No, but in and of itself, no. Does it help with skills? No, in and of itself, but it does have reputational value in some ways. Is this enough? Um, I think that whatever the decision, not my decision to make, thankfully, but I think whatever decision the university takes, it is possible for the university to play a role in shaping the debates about rankings, because there have been attempts to look at fairer systems. In fact, I saw an article this morning about it. But as from a government point of view, we do not rank universities. We do not look at the rankings of universities. Although, of course, universities do use our data that we produce on behalf of the system to rank themselves publicly as well. So, and just my last point um, in conclusion, I think that the expectations and the complexities of universities are growing. There are huge threats for universities. I've outlined hopefully not too many of them, but there are also enormous opportunities. And I think the overarching channel is, is, is overarching challenge is how to negotiate the need to ensure that universities are a force for social good in a world of increasing competition, increasing greed, and increasing marketization. And um, these ways. I'm just going to end with this quote just to just poke you a little bit. Um, the quote is from Steve Biko, <laughs> and it's in time. We shall be in a position to bestow on South Africa the greatest possible gift, a more human face. I just wanted to end with that quote, and those of you who know me will know this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> I suspect that debate's going to come back. Thank you, thank you very much, Sandy, for telling it like it is. Um, complex, multi-layered, but certainly not insurmountable. And I suppose this is the purpose of today's session, or the session for this week, that we should engage um, uh, with exactly the kind of complexities, the challenges, and the contradictions that you presented to us. The two presentations on the strategic challenges by the Vice Chancellor as well as Sistan Tishloen require that we should have some kind of structure in terms of how we deal with this. This is probably my last act for today before I hand over uh, to the facilitators. Um, but I just would like us to go through the rules that the team has discussed and put together and see if we can agree on those. They're called 10 plus 1 rules. Let's just go through them. Um, I hope rule number one is not too late for this session, but certainly um, it is... Make it bigger. Make it bigger. Okay, Remy, if you can just help make it bigger. These rules are also available on your shared folder, and I know Professor Mada did ask about the Wi-Fi. We announced at the beginning that we should repeat again. Please use um, Mpegwani guest Wi-Fi. It doesn't require any passwords or something like that. If you just click there, you are instantly connected. 
and you can also be able to download the rules. But there are 10 rules plus one. Let's just go through them and see if we are in agreement. Rule number one, we are urged to come prepared to each and every session. And preparation is supported by documentation that is uh, on the shared folder. I hope everybody has got access to the shared folder. Very important documents, discussion documents there that are going to feature in the engagements that we're going to have over the next two days. So please read those documents and come prepared. Let us all be time conscious. And that means that we be seated at the start time of each session. If we are able to do this, we don't only show respect to one another, but we show respect to our purpose here. And we'll be able to follow the program to the letter and therefore do justice to what brought us out um, of Makanda to Kegwedi this weekend. Be mentally and physically uh, present. Uh, it's easy to be physically present, but simultaneously be totally absent from the sessions. That means that we need to pay attention and fight the temptation to constantly check and send emails or text messages, scrolling through social media, and taking frequent calls. That is not only a distraction to our core participants, but it also does not serve the purpose of spending time together here in uh, a strategic planning session. So that's rule number three. Follow the agenda. You'll see that it is particularly structured in a way that seeks um, to aid the, the presentations, the engagement, the discussions, and therefore the outcomes of this session. Uh, please familiarize yourself with the thematic arrangement of that agenda. It is deliberately structured in that way. The rule number five, can we all help create an inclusive and accommodating environment for all constructive viewpoints? So this is, again, going to be uh, dependent upon how we conduct ourselves and how we relate to the discussions here. Surely, there will be issues that need some robust engagement, but those are issues, not the people. Who, who express those issues. So if there's any attack to be, to be mounted, please let's make sure that the target is the issue and not the person. Can we try to reconcile all questions, inputs and comments to the institutional interest? And institutional interest is not always, um, doesn't always have one-on-one -on -one relation to individual interests or possibly even entity interests. So if we're going to do justice to those strategic challenges expressed by the two speakers already, we're going to have to foreground institutional interest ahead of any other interest, however powerful that interest might be. Can we be resolution focused and be solution focused? The easier thing is to problematize everything and to point out the complexities of everything. But uh, what is helpful is with that illuminating diagnosis of the complexities we face is also a challenge to ourselves to look at solutions and resolutions of some of those complexities that we face. All deliberations at this will be confidential. Uh, in other words, please, this is a protected space. People are expected to express themselves without fear, or favor, or prejudice in attacking issues that need to be attacked and any communication about this session will be done through institutional official channels. So all the recording that you see here is very much an internal arrangement and anything and everything that will be reported about this um, will be done through the institutional processes. So institutional policy and regulatory framework is not suspended um, at this um, session. Can we try to close decisions? And I know that the facilitators have expressed that much of the decision making might happen in the breakaway rooms. So if you can use language there that closes decisions, that is not ambiguous, that is commonly understood, and that settles issues, and not keep them open-ended and open to multiplicity of interpretations uh, after the session. And finally, um, we are urged to listen with an open mind and always assume positive intent. Um, this helps in terms of how we relate to the content of the presentation. You know, it, 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 it just opens up that engagement space and for us to be able to deal with the substance of what is presented. So any comment and every question and or contribution will be assumed to be expressed in good faith with the best intentions, with the best 
interest of Rhodes University and only Rhodes University at heart. Then the plus one is collecting awareness of these rules and our support for our ground rules. Are there any objections to the ground rules? No? Any objections? Going, going? Then it means we have all agreed to these rules. Let's then attend to them. So I will invite um, Randy as we are now beginning to connect the strategy to the actual engagement that we're going to have here. And with that, I will also be handing over to Professor Neil Pierce as well as uh, Mr. Trevor Amos to take it forward. Remy, I hand over to you for the review of the ICT. Thank you very much. Before you hand over, Chair, uh, can you make your document downloadable so that you can just download the full folder? Since this is only me that's struggling to download it. Okay, I will just repeat that for those who may not have it. Can, can we, Master Eckhart, Dr. Dinkel, I'm sure you could hear, if you can make the document downloadable. And uh, if you still have that problem, Professor Sindo, please uh, make contact with us. We'll see what alternative arrangements we can make for you. Thank you. All right, just to repeat again, the Wi-Fi connection is in temporary gaps, no password required, and you are able to access the documents that are going to be presented here. Thank you very much, Mr. Remy. Over to you. Thank you, Program Director. Good morning, colleagues. Um, when I joined the university in 2011, uh, the VC provided me with a number of documents. Um, of course, I also joined in the middle of the transformation uh, summit. Um, the VC provide, provided me with the work that has already been done in developing the IDP. Um, also including the VC's inaugural um, vision of speech. Um, also uh, documents emerging from the Transformation Summit. So it made the job of coordinating development of the IDP a lot easier as um, the content is almost uh, there, it's just to consolidate ideas. So we did um, a stakeholder engagement that are required that produce the current IDP. Um, unfortunately, I would say um, two years out of the five years span of the IDP, um, we were struck with the setback of COVID-19. So it is in that context that we are um, we should have that at the back of our mind as we look a little back. Uh, this Le Cotla is about looking forward, but also to look forward and to look a bit back to know where you're coming from in order to determine um, uh, the road forward. Um, to even begin to look at the progress report, I think it's also important uh, to look at the context of strategic planning within the context of uh, the university. Um, the idea of strategy, uh, strategic planning, is fairly uh, new and it is more prominent in the business world. Um, as much as the concept is generally good in terms of looking forward, uh, but we should also bear in mind that there are huge disparities between how universities are operate and, and how uh, the, the business world operates. Um, firstly, in terms of timing, one year is a very long time for, for business, <coughs> six months, months have strategies for months because we're looking at products that are quick to produce for us. No products per se. And, and the university is about forward looking as the VC has, has, has mentioned, looking into the fourth, uh, you know, into the fast future, thinking ahead of time. 
Um, so the time frames are really not um, as conceptualized as we have in the business world. Consensus uh, is firstly it's about dialogue, it's about uh, debate in the business world. Usually, a top down approach to management. Um, customers, we have no defined customers. Um, students, community, the research community, who are you designing strategy for? So, we have no strictly defined set of customers. Another quote and the fallacy of great animation. Uh, graduates are not products, research output, or such. Um, Publications are not necessarily products, they're just debates, debates, situations from where others um, have started. So it's on un ending debate, knowledge, um, and also content. It differs a lot. Uh, the concept of competition, our um, universities in the sector, even private universities are not necessarily um, our competition. There are uh, our partners in the common quest for, for public good. So, therefore, it makes planning a bit in the university context a bit, a bit complex. Um, however, planning could be taken in the light of a tool for reflection. That's the way I look at it, especially in the, in the, in the university context. We are required by law, uh, by regulation, to have strategic plans. Um, so uh, the requirement of, 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 of the law of the country, um, of course, as I mentioned, be a, a tool for, for inflation. I'm not going to uh, talk a lot about this. The SA landscape, there is a very ambitious plan my government, uh, you know, 2030, just by the corner, seven years plus, you can see uh, the pressures of the plan of the landscape, government regulation, and the aspiration of government on our, our own institutional planning. Uh, these are real. Um, um, Dr. Dr. Lewis has already mentioned. Um, some of these. And um, also, I think she also mentioned um, the, the worrying output or the worrying um, situation in terms of student achievement um, from the school level up to higher education level um, of the um, hundreds. Learners that enter into grade one each year is for 2008 cohorts, and I'm sure that there might not have been a lot of changes. 40% uh, drop out before matric, and uh, approximately 14% uh, at matric. Out of that, 12 pass with uh, university access, and um, out of the 12%, only 4% actually go on to achieve um, the university degree after six years. So it is in this context that we are situated. Um, um, it is in this context that we have defined innovative ways, as mentioned earlier, uh, we are known for uh, pioneering academic development, uh, teaching and learning, scholarship of teaching and learning uh, for higher education. So, in evaluating this, um, the IEP, uh, this is our approach. Uh, we are looking at progress done against each indicator, each, each uh, objective, each goal, and, and, and actual percentage over time, uh, degrees, degrees in measures um, are inversely measured. Um, present scores on a scale of 1 to 10, and the scores are 
presented at, at um, different levels, objectives, goals, and the overall ideas. Um, in those instances where we don't have that opportunity 22, um, we use the 2021 data. Uh, of course, we know that we are still not to the academic year. Um, we don't have data graduates for this year, research output, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are instances where we don't have data at all. Um, we'll show those as well. Okay, so just to give a some background for people who are not uh, very familiar with our IDP. Uh, we have seven goals, um, and each of the goals uh, associated with specific objectives. Um, each objective has some indicator of success, and for each uh, indicator we have um, the baseline information for 2017 as our baseline year um, performance across uh, the year 2018 to 2020. So um, we also have our IDP indicator definition. The document is also in the pack. So how, how we have defined each indicator, the derivation of each indicator, how it is measured and who is responsible for, for each, each measure. In terms of the overall performance, um, we have a score out of 10 of 6.5, that's about 65% progress towards our target in achieving the, the the IDP 2018 to 2022. And for me, um, as I mentioned earlier, given that COVID took away almost two years out of, of, out of the five, um, this is a, a realistic expectation. Um, guys, interpretation of, of, of indicators are written here. The greener the data that we actually need. So looking at um, each goal, I'm not going to dwell a lot of time because these presentations are there in, in the shared slide. In the interest of time, um, looking at each each of the goals, um, you see that um, goal number five about public good. Um, for the goal number seven about public good, uh, we seem to have done well there. Um, goal number six about infrastructure, including IT services, seem to have done also um, um, commendably well. Um, for goal number four around governance and management, seem to have done also well. Um, the area that we are looking at um, much improvement would be around the, the area of, uh, of, of digital learning, um, community engagement around our degree offerings. Um, and again, it could be as a result of how we have structured our our indicators, uh, and part of the lessons learned is some of our indicators are, are really um, ambiguous. Uh, we need to find ways of making things a bit clearer and, and go on. Um, so this, these are the calls for each of um, the objectives leading up to the goal. I'm not going to dwell a lot on that. And also, uh, these are the scores also uh, for goal number two, leading up to the, the highest score here for this goal, 63%. Um, um, goal on, on research, 
part of the set. And these are the areas that are formed. Quite commendable, both top and off grade, good uh, qualification of, of, of academics, improved quite significantly over the period. Um, financial sustainability, governance, and, uh, and management, or is also quite commendable. Um, of course, we know um, Lord University is reputed for its ethical leadership strong management of resources. Um, um, this is quite uh, really commendable. Um, on the traditional cultural attraction, uh, nurturing, retention of staff, some areas quite positive, some areas would be um, um, good improvement. On infrastructure, I've already mentioned um, this, and of course, goal number seven, which is um, around promotion of the university as an institution for, for public good, with an overall score of 78%. Okay, so, in essence, what does all of this mean for, for the, for, in my view, core thing, which is around getting students in, getting them to succeed, um, and also at the research intensive university, getting the university to continue to um, be a leading university in, in, in research front. Um, so in terms of our enrollment over the period, you can see that, um, that even though the enrollment seems to be seems to be increasing. Um, over time, we have not been able to meet our enrollment targets, and that is quite more uh, significant for the COVID for the COVID year. Um, in terms of student success, looking at our base year 2017 as the last audited data available for this exercise. Um, the thing to look at for here is that 2017 our average undergrad success rate was 4%. Uh, this has decreased to 82% in 2020. And, and I'm sure the 2021 figures might even be uh, a little low. Um, but the, the issue is that uh, in comparison with the, with the sector, we are still above 80%, which is really um, also um, commendable. In terms of research production, Looking at our baseline year here, that production um, starts out with units here. You can see a substantial decline between 2017 and 2020. Uh, master's <coughs> graduates, PhD graduates for 2017. You can see how we have performed in 2020. Uh, research outputs. Total research output per academic uh, 3.2 for 2017 and 2.9 for 2020. Um, in terms of academic staff, this is quite interesting. Um, Public academic staff with doctoral degrees, 63% in, in 2017, this increased to 6 in 2020, I think 2021 figures in around 3 percent. Okay, that's quite commendable. There's something around the sufficient capacity um, at the research intensive um, This um, 
it's packed with a lot of information. But I think um, in discussing most of the things, most of the other um, aspects of our planning, it is critical for us to look at this. Um, this is a mapping of our student body. We have for 2020 data, we have first time in 20 students, which make up 20% of, of our undergraduate population. Um, a total of 8,592 students. Um, this is how they are composed in terms of uh, postgraduate undergrad, 26%. And 73%, uh, 26% postgrad, 73% undergrad. And in terms of the season categories, our students are registered in uh, science, engineering, technology, 80%, education, 14%, humanities, 40%, and, and business management, 15%. Now, let's look at challenge for the same year 2020. Um, first time entry at 15%. Um, total enrollment was over that, uh, close to 31,000. But the most interesting thing is look at the postgrad component here at the 3% and look at our 26%. Another interesting thing is see how the student body, in terms of the season area of registration, 25% um, humanities, 49% science and technology. Um, this has a lot of implications with a number of things, such intensive and funding. Um, let's look at inverse of case counts. First time in print, 16 percent. Postgraduate, 39 percent. And online with humanities here, 30 percent. 46 percent. So the, the, the implication for this is, for me, as, as a planning person, is that we we ascribe ourselves as a research intensive university. We need to do something about this. Postgraduate enrollment. For us to remain under 10,000 students, which of course we may not be able to grow as, 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 as much as the sector is growing uh, because of the obvious reasons, infrastructure issues and all that, we need to do something about how our students are, are composed in terms of student categories. So do something about postgraduate proportion, do something about um, our student composition in terms of the students. Um, so for the research intensive universities, the average in terms of postgraduate enrollment is around 31% um, or so, uh, while we are sitting at 26%. Uh, recently we had um, Recently, we had a visitor from the University of Pacific Islands in Nigeria, um, the DVC Research and Engagement. She mentioned that the university is currently at 60% postgraduate and planning to get to 60%. That is a very, um, um, very bold decision to the university getting um, in that space, also knowing that the country. 200 million people, the pressure 
on at the time of on that one. Okay, so <coughs> the big change is the student, the, the university is transforming quite rapidly, especially in terms of the student body. Uh, we, we, we can see, look at this, you can look at the, 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 um, this in the, the in sharp product. Um, the university is now mirroring the national demographic diversity. So looking at the 2011 census figures um, and doing all the competitions, what, what this actually means is if you choose two people at random from the general population, the probability of getting diverse people from different population groups from our population is actually at 6%. The reverse of this is that if you choose two people at random from the general population, you are 70% likely to get two Afri black African people. And that's our university is zero in that. Uh, that is quite a significant uh, change. Um, another change is that um, the percentage, I mean, the number of students on NEDFAC administered uh, funding has significantly increased, on the track increased by 86% between 2017 and 2021. This has impact also um, on, on um, our, the diversity of our student population, what it means uh, from which schools are these um, students coming from, what are we going to do differently to support them. Um, this um, table here shows that on average, um, the percentage of our students completing their qualification in minimum time for the bachelor, for the B's degrees is um, gradually, gradually going down. Um, there are some important lessons learned in the process. Uh, there is a suggestion to clearly link budget with IDP so that IDP will not just be <coughs> aspirational documents, but to put invest in what we think are the, um, the areas of development for our university, how to be declared with certain indicators. Um, and also, um, it is recommended for us to have IDP in operational plans and departmental, divisional, faculty level, um, and our survey tool for participation and voice, and of course also um, um, planning as, as an important tool for not necessarily for compliance, but also for reflection. Thank you. Until now, the focus of our sessions has really been looking back, but also getting some idea of getting the context and some ideas of the way forward. The, the next set of sessions, both for the rest of today and the first part of tomorrow morning, are really focused on work that's been done already in the different working groups. And you will see that there's going to be presentations and in quite a short period of time for each of those presentations. And so what I wanted to do as we're about to shift gears to start to look at some of the working groups is just to clarify expectations. So the idea would be that as we have these different presentations, there's half an hour, we're gonna to stick to that time limit. If the presenter completes within the half an hour, then we can have some time for questions and answers. But I think really the, the nature of the questions as we have these report back from working groups is not so much to debate the issues, but rather to get clarity on any kind of content that has been presented. All right, so the, the time for debate really happens tomorrow when we have the breakaway sessions. And so what I wanted to do just before Prof. Suri uh, presents on the vision and mission statement is ask six people to stand up and the reason for getting them to stand up is as you hear the presentations today 
there might be particular ideas you've got, comments you want to make to feed into particular working groups or breakaway sessions tomorrow. So I want to just help to identify who these people are so that you can then either in the break speak to them or you can send them a message, send them an email for example and they then have that information for their, their breakaway session. So if I can ask the, the following people to stand, the first breakaway session will be focusing on teaching and learning and student access experience and success which really draws from tracks A, B, and C, and that's Dr. Mandy Schlengler. Mandy, if you can just stand up so people at the back there. That's Mandy. So anything to do with teaching and learning, student access, experience, and success, PQM, the program qualification mix, please speak to Mandy about that. Thanks, Mandy. The, the second track is going to be on research and creative endeavor, and that draws mainly from track D, and Professor Joanne Jarmus, if you can stand. Anything to do with research. Thank you, Joanne. Then we have a third breakaway session that focuses on community engagement, partnerships, and internationalization. This draws from working groups E and F primarily, and Professor Patrice Mwepo. Thank you. Right, there's Patrice. We then have a fourth track on sustainability, and that is from the working group G in particular, Professor Helena von Koller. Thanks, Helena. Then there's infrastructure, equipment, and digital transformation, going from tracks H and I, and that's Professor Innocent Musinga. In front of the, on the side there. Thanks, Innocent. And then the last one is People, Values and Culture, which draws from track J, and that's being shared by Professor Lynette Lowe. Thank you, Lynette. Okay, so it was quite important then as we then have the presentations, feel free to make some notes of particular issues that you have. You've signed up to join one of those breakaway rooms, but there might be ideas you have for some of the others. And this is what we're just trying to clarify that you make notes of those, that you then have a chance to speak to that person that, or, or otherwise email them at some point so they do have that as part of the deliberations for their breakaway session. Okay, so really for most of today and the first part of tomorrow is then to get the report backs from the different working groups and if time allows to have a couple of minutes for clarification of what's been said so it's clear what they've presented. Thank you, I'm going to hand over to Professor Suri. Hi. Um, visions and missions. Uh, visions and missions have become pretty much a uh, standard pop. strong enough voice, can you hear me? You want me to Rosa, can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay, visions and missions have become very much part of uh, all organisations, whether they're for profit, not for profit, university, you name it, they're all sitting around with a vision and mission. They're sometimes vilified. Uh, people don't really like them, uh, some people don't really like them, and others think um, oh, they're part and parcel of the landscape. I think you should like them. Uh, they're an excellent mechanism by which the organisation, all its people, and all that who interact with them have a pretty good idea of what it is that the organisation is about. Otherwise I'm afraid you end up with everybody running around in different directions and you don't get any traction. In essence, try and get everybody or processes behind a single arrow deck so that you can make progress forward, and that's really important. Typically, a vision is an inspirational statement uh, of an idealistic future of the organization. It's not something intended to be that you're going to knock up 
as we really bar this afternoon. It's meant to be something quite dreamy. It's out there, uh, and we aspire to it. And tethered to that is the mission statement of why the organization exists. What's its purpose? Uh, what are we supposed to be doing? And the two and a couple of other things are tightly tethered. Uh, your planning starts with the vision and mission. I was given this position for no other reason other than the fact that you start off with a vision and a mission. And everything flows from that. So this is really important. What we sign now is for keeps for the next few days. Uh, and the vision must align with the mission, the strategic planning, the culture, and the core values of the organization. And you can see that arrow head being crafted uh, with the vision and mission at the top. Everything is intended to fall underneath. So let's have a look at some visions and missions. LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn's vision is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. Truly lofty stuff. Uh, that's their vision. That's what they want to be. Uh, their mission is to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. Have a look at Starbucks. To inspire and nurture the human spirit. <laughs> one person, <laughs> one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. That's really cool. And you go to Starbucks, and that's what their mission and vision is. That's what they aspire to. You drop on down to Hilton Hotels uh, to fill the earth with the light and warmth, the hospitality, by delivering exceptional experiences in every hotel, every guest, and every time. <laughs> I quite like that. Uh, I was wondering whether they were waiting. <laughs> <And so>, uh, <laughs> Their Wi-Fi is not working. <laughs> Maybe it's every hotel, every guest, every car, but not by Wi-Fi. Maybe they want to look at that. We can also look at Uber. Uh, we ignite opportunity by setting the world in motion. Simple stuff. Simple stuff. Every organization has one. Even Bergen's or Bergen's Planets in Rudderford County has got a vision and it is to keep it flowing. <laughs> <laughs> to keep it flowing. Uh, I've, I've decided to borrow from Hilton Hotels and I'm going to be sending the management of Barracons uh, and modification to keep it flowing. Every toilet, every cistern and every flush. <laughs> That's quite a lofty vision. But let's port that to Rhodes University. To keep it flowing, every toilet, every system, every flush, not the one toilet in GLP, not the two in the main admin building, and none in the management department. <laughs> every toilet, every system, and every flush should be the vision that it works everywhere. And that's quite important to remember as you try and put together our vision for mission. Let's have a look at Carnegie Mellon. To have a transformative impact on society through continual innovation in education, research, creativity, and entrepreneurship. Hold it back to Africa. What's Macaria University's vision? It's to be a thought leader of knowledge generation for societal transformation and development. Their mission, Macaraga University, is committed to providing transformative and innovative teaching, learning, research, and services responsive to dynamic national and global needs. Kind of quite cool, read about uh, Kind of guessing there. So let's give a stab at some Rhodes University visions based on a couple that I've given you already. So let's be inspired by Starbucks. To inspire and nurture knowledge generation, one student, one course, one degree at a time. How about Uber? 
to ignite opportunities by setting students and graduates' curiosity on fire. <laughs> and finally, bring it right home. Let's go to real work to keep knowledge flowing. Every student, every course, every degree, no knowledge movement. <laughs> Would any of those suffice uh, as our new uh, vision for our institution? The important thing to remember is, these are short, they see, you are never ever going to forget what Rudolf Wood Bachman's plan is. <laughs> You're never going to forget it. And in fact, the Bishop family of Grahamstown, Makanda, had better take kind of care um, to keep it flowing. Uh, and maybe I can dig completion and say, hey, <laughs> in the planning department, <laughs> to keep it flowing. <laughs> so what did we do as a group? Um, we took the current vision and mission, uh, and we looked at the work undertaken in previous university workshops in respect to vision and mission. Uh, we considered a variety of local, national, and international statements of development, intention, and goals. NDP, SDG, Africa Division 263. We did a lot. We looked at our uh, logo and motto, and I do hope all of you remember what those are. Uh, we looked then deep at all of them, and we put together a vision and mission. We sent it to everybody. You saw it. We got your comments, and we developed a new vision and mission. There's the current one, the one to which Tandy referred to. Um, it's in the preface uh, of our calendar and ideally uh, should be on your bathroom mirror. <laughs> so when you get up in the morning, uh, you are totally taken with what it is that you're going to spend the rest of the day. And you can go through all of that. It's about identity, freedom, moral values and everything else. In addition to the vision and mission, we also crafted a variety of undertakings. If we've got this meeting and mission, then we also undertake to do a lot of things. There was a page full of stuff uh, about basic human and civil rights, all the way through to excellence and quality assurance. Key in all of that was not brevity. <laughs> and again, I'll chance my arm and I'll ask any of you to please tell me what our vision and mission is and our undertakings. Uh, and let's see how far you get. And if that was on your bathroom mirror, your mirror would not be very much use because it would be nowhere <laughs> where you would be reflected. Uh, it just wouldn't be there. So, these are the guiding lights that we took on. Uh, we looked at our motto, this, that, this, veritas, strength, courage, and truth. We looked at our logo, where leaders learn. Um, our vice chancellor's VCXP, uh, the 10 point plan that he put forward at the time of his inauguration. And then obviously we looked at the uh, Africa Vision uh, 2063 and the SDGs. Quite clearly, our niche in all of those is education. Uh, that's where uh, our particular contribution here happens to be. And here we have it, unveiled for the first time for the benefit of the select few who are attending this Lechotla is Rose University's proposed new vision. And it goes like this. To be foremost in the generation advancement of locally responsive and globally engaged knowledge dedicated to the creation of a just and a sustainable society. And our, so that's what we would like to be. It's our aspiration. It's not going to be this afternoon. It will be any time. And our mission is to provide transformative education, rigorous scholarship and research that seeks to produce knowledge that advances the frontiers of science, human understanding and wisdom, cultivates knowledgeable and skilled graduates. And I thought Tony might love that, the skilled graduates. Um, and caring and engaged citizens, responsible, courageous and ethical leaders, and enable society, social and economic development based on respectful and mutually uh, beneficial partnerships with diverse communities. Let's unpack that a little bit. So there's our vision. 
what should you be able to remember from that vision? Uh, first and foremost, it is to be foremost. We aspire to be the best. I don't mind a bit of competition. We do aspire to be the best. Um, in addition to that, we're into the knowledge game. We're going to generate new, and of course we're going to advance what we currently have. And that knowledge is going to be responsive to our local context that engages with, takes cognizance of, or operates in a global context. And we're doing all of that for what? And that is to create a just and a sustainable society that, like one of our respondents said, enhances the human experience. So again, does that satisfy the tenets of a good vision? Can you remember it? We're going to be the best, Tony. We're going to be foremost. If we generate an advancement of locally responsive but globally engaged knowledge, dedicated to what? A just and a sustainable society. Kind of embracing all that we hold as dear and that which we aspire to. And as far as our mission is concerned, it is meant to be a transformative experience. Transformative education, vigorous scholarship. And there are three categories that we're particularly interested in. The first of which is knowledge. That is important for us. That is going to advance the frontiers of science, human understanding, and wisdom. And there are going to be people involved a more humane experience. And we're talking about our graduates, our citizens, and our leaders. And we've chosen particular words that are emotive. We want them to be knowledgeable and skilled, our graduates. We want our citizens to be caring and engaged. And that our leaders, like our motto and our logo, Ports. They must be responsible, they must be courageous, and of course, they must be ethical. I'd really like the people that we produce for roads, our leaders, to be responsible. They're going to stand there and not say, I oh, don't know, no, it wasn't me. They're going to stand there, they're going to put both their feet forward, and they're going to say, what? And they're going to own it. They're going to be courageous. They're going to have a little bit of nerve. They're going to be able to stand up and maybe prick that balloon. Provoke somebody because they need to be provoked. They're going to be courageous. But they're going to be unambiguously <coughs> principled. And those are the kind of leaders that we would like to produce at Rhodes. Responsible, courageous, and ethical. And finally, <coughs> communities. And that's what we like. Enabling social and economic development based on respectful and mutually beneficial partnerships with diverse communities. Diverse communities. So let's not have an argument about who the, your community is. Name it. Let's work with the community there. So our mission has got those four components to it. It's a transformative experience involving knowledge, people, and our communities. So you can sit up in bed in the morning, you can promptly walk through to the bathroom, look at the mirror, and you can see we want to be foremost in the generation and advancement of knowledge that is locally responsive, but globally engaged, dedicated to doing what? It is to produce a just and a sustainable society. Wash your face, brush your teeth, and as you put your shoes on, so what are you going to do today? You're going to go and create a transformative experience for people that involves knowledge, people, and the community. Don't get in your car, because the sustainable people will have a fit, walk to work, and enjoy the day. The new vision and mission comes to you with a strong recommendation from myself, Cesare, Dahai, Owen, and Shui, 
and it's there for you to go run around and road to the CU vision and mission. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. And what you saw as part of the process there was there's a number of iterations that took place. There's been um, information distributed about draft of that vision and mission. They received further information about that. They then revised that. And this is then the, the final product. And this is something which we wanted to be clear on that this is then the vision and mission. We don't want to have lots of debating around it, but it becomes quite central then for going forward in determining what our key strategies. So what we want to do now is reimagine what are the strategies of the university that will realize this vision and this mission. Are there any points for clarification for Professor Sue? Really just a question uh, about the global engagement, globally engaged, whether um, it doesn't have to be locally engaged as well. You know, I just want to understand whether it can be locally and globally responsive and engaged. And then and then, just, just a question. Yes. <laughs> It's, a, it's an interesting comment. Uh, I've often said, when I've been approached by uh, students in the faculty, uh, and they say, Dave, what the hell are you trying to do over here? Uh, and I've often said to them, I'm not particularly interested in producing a graduate uh, that is incredibly knowledgeable about the economic affairs of the businesses in Baker Street. I don't want you to know that. What I want you to do is to be hugely conscious of what on earth is going on locally, right over here. But I'd like you to be informed uh, by a whole host of things uh, that are going around. So that when my commerce students leave, they can tell you about the economy of that this week in my country. They can give you a good solution to it, that that solution is going to be based on the local context, the regional, the national, the continental, and the international, so that we can bring that in. Whether we want to nuance it um, to uh, really locally, only responding to the local uh, using some sort of global framework. Um, locally responsive really speaks to being conscious of where you are. But I'll tell you what, someone's dying to say something. <laughs> that local responsiveness already assumes your local engagement. You can't be locally responsive without being engaged. Uh, and so interpret and understand it in that way. We're not simply saying you will simply be responsive. In the first instance, you must be locally engaged. So it's all embedded in there. And the same thing with the global engagement. Uh, there's a certain level of responsiveness to the global challenges, but it is also about contributing to our global accumulated stock of knowledge so that whoever is wherever, they might draw some learnings and some experience from that. So all of that is, is in there. Thank you, uh, Just to say, will it be obvious to everyone? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you. Um, is this final or and, and we're just discussing con um, phrases for clarification or can we have a look, is there space for a look? Is this a final product? <laughs> yes, I can answer that. Um, it is a semi-final product. <laughs> Now I'm saying this because we all have preferences of certain words which should be in there and certain things phrased in a certain way. 
I think the issue here is the substance. Uh, if we have not used your preferred word, are you comfortable with the substance of what is there? That for me is the most important thing. So it is almost by now. 99 percent. <laughs> Dr. Sisani, somebody said it's 99%. Um, I, 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 I think it, it, it's, it's open. I mean, comments have been uh, called for. Uh, so. Don't call us for 1%. You don't call us over for 1%. How about two? <laughs> All comments are there. It's not a final one. Uh, it's been put to uh, the Great University Commission. Uh, it's for, for discussion. I, I think I'm going to say that I'm new, I don't know what has been happening. So I'm this new student that must be accommodated. But what I want, uh, I, I was reading Uko Mandela, trying to acquaint myself with Uko Mandela. And the very first introduction um, that I was looking at in Uko Mandela, I just thought that there is something that I would like to put forward in re in redesigning the structure as it exists. And that's why I'm asking whether what we have is final or the space for coming in with how can we restructure this differently? That is what, that is where my question is coming from. It's not only just on the vision and the mission, but just looking at the introduction of Comandela. I was struck by something that I just thought that perhaps it could be brought forward. So, can I just hear, is there a particular point you would like to make about what changes to incorporate here? I don't know how much of what I was thinking could affect. It might not affect um, directly, it might affect the nations. Like when we talk of diverse communities, it might affect who I'm talking about. So, if one talks about something else be, be, be beyond this, it might affect the definition. So it isn't the change of the concepts that they exist there, but it might be in the context of the broader context of what we're talking about. So if I understand correctly, you agree with the substance of what is there, yeah. but there might be certain ideas you have that could give um, more detail to that, could yeah. elaborate on certain aspects as opposed to changing the detail. So, understood. Um, you will notice in our previous uh, vision and mission there were undertakings. Um, so it was quite a lengthy uh, documentation. I think the idea is that um, in our IDP that we would elaborate and make clearer uh, particular components about how we might achieve or a, a better definition or a clearer definition of particular aspects. So there would be lots of opportunities for clarification, expansion of what is meant. Understood. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Happy to have an email sent to me uh, for clarification of stuff in it. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Dave. Thank you very much and, and congratulations on a, on a wonderful proposition. And the one thing that I think would be wonderful to see maybe reflecting even a little bit more strongly, although it is probably implied, is the notion of happiness. And we may have driven the smoke at that, but in fact happiness is a critical component of global economic studies now. I mean, Rudy made a good career of that and, and he looked at the latest last few uh, Nobel Prizes in economics that were all related to happiness and construct. So that actually um, the end pursuit of the human endeavor, is it not? 
Um, and so if there was a way for us, without being prescriptive, but I just commend, uh, commend it to the committee to consider whether somewhere in our statement of purpose is also uh, to advance uh, human happiness, which is now regarded as a respectable measure of societal performance and would certainly um, be in agreement with the statement of being at the foremost or in the leadership of scholarship and thought. And perhaps we might be the first university to express uh, that idea. Thanks, Hubert. Thank you. Um, I really love this version of mission. I think it's great. Um, I don't know if my comment is is um, 